What could we expect yeah. next from Frank Ocean? Uh, I don't know. I, I you kind of like, gotta wait and see. We'll see how it how it um trickles into the music and the, and the final product. I can't say much other than that. Album of the year. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I'm. I'm just glad people. You know, people received it. You know, because I, I they absolutely did. I, I, I want to show you a tweet from Kimbra. It says, Exciting. "With the current state of social media and possibilities for instant communication, there's a real pressure for artists to share their ideas as quickly as they come into our heads. But despite the many opportunities that this kind of behaviour can offer, we all have to ask ourselves a question at some stage: How is all this externalisation affecting the creative work itself?" In this video, I'm going to be looking at the model of Frank Ocean, breaking down how his elusive attitude towards sharing informs his creative process, investigating concepts around self-ownership and artistic independence, and finding ways that we ourselves might manage our ideas and projects more successfully. This following discussion looks at issues all artists have to position themselves against in some form, so if anything comes up for you, be sure to let us know in the comments below. This is Creative Minds, and thanks for watching. Could have me feeling the way I do. No. No, I'm not gonna give any hints. Uh, no, no, I'm not. F that. Nope, I'm not doing that. I, I'm just, if it goes well, I'll call you and be like, yeah, it went well, and then I might tell you. Now, in a moment, I want to jump into a magazine interview of Frank looking at his direct experiences around the sharing of ideas. But first I think it's important to establish this artist's foundation in independence and the inherent link he places between complete self-ownership and doing his best work. I don't know if it's about me, but I think just creativity in general, um, just doing what you want is so important. You know, doing what you feel is, is right and what connects with you is important. And I know that might be, you know, cliche, trite, corny, sappy, whatever you want to say, but, you know, um, one of the coolest things about what I'm experiencing right now, as far as people responding to the songs I wrote and what I what I decided to do, is that it really is me, you know, it's, it's so when people say they f with it, it's like they f with me, and that feels cool. Frank obviously values that relationship between his identity and his work very closely, and he exercises and protects that relationship by maintaining a tight creative control over every aspect of his projects. Never ever trust the free roll. I never let a random motherfucker shoot the B-roll. I never ask advice from him, cause what could he know? As artists in 2023, we're empowered by technology to choreograph all aspects of our output. This ability to construct image can be a double-edged sword for some, but looking back we can very much place Frank in a generation of young artists who found their independence and creative control through the new tools of production and distribution. I think we all change each other's paths, you know. They've um, liberated my thinking in, in some ways, creative, creatively and in a sense of knowing that you can do a lot of it by yourself, you know, um, not just the songs, but just taking control of your whole movement. I was 15 when I first drew that donut. Five years later for our label, yeah, we own it. I started an empire. I I'm down tips off the soda pop. As artists, it's interesting to look at examples of success and to try and build our own mini empires based on online presence and distribution. But for many, this constant need to create both the main artistic output and a range of content to support it can lead to a problematic relationship between externalization and doing our best creative work. Here we see Frank as someone who protects their creative process as well as anyone out there. When I worked on my first project, Nostalgia Ultra, Frank says, I hardly told anyone. Even people I was working with at the time didn't know about it. There's something that happens when you say what you're doing before it's done, and most of it is not positive. You're accountable for that version that you talk about, when it very well may undergo change. It's usually better for me to make what I make, put it out or don't, and then talk about it freely. Now this sentiment that Frank is expressing is definitely something I've felt in my own work. But what exactly are we losing when we share our ideas with others in person or online? To jump into this idea further, I want to pull up an interview of UK rapper and all around prolific artistic force, Little Sims. And I want to work on new music and I want to just lock myself away and just create. It's cool to start projects 
knowing that you're you're going in to start a project but also not putting too much stress on it like just go and get out whatever you want to say don't focus on necessarily what you want the album to be or how many songs or the name of it or just say what you want to say do you know what i'm saying it's the fun part where you just go and have fun and you just bang on the drums or i just grab a mic and just freestyle and you know what i'm saying Sims, the beauty of starting a new project is the freedom and openness of that creative space. And when we tell people what we're doing before we've done it, we are limiting the space for our art to be discovered and transformed throughout the process of creation. Now looking back to Frank, we can see how his elusive approach allows him to protect that space for his art and himself, shirking expectations around exactly who he is and what he's doing. Most people have a hard time predicting where I might be or what I might be doing if I'm not in the studio. like. I could be doing, you know, uh, monkey form by the beach. I could be doing indoor rock climbing. I could be reading. So we've seen how Frank manages his creative space by staying off the map of online media, but with the extent of secrecy he holds over his process, I feel like there's something else going on here too. I'm working with the string arranger right now in Rio, Frank says, and every time we go back and forth, because I don't put things on the internet, I have to send a drive with someone to Rio, or I have to go myself. Now when you're Frank Ocean, obviously there are practical concerns around leaks when sharing your work, but reading this, I wonder if we're witnessing something beyond rational protection, and moving towards the fetishization of his creative process. Now don't get me wrong, I don't necessarily see this as a negative thing, Artistic ideas have to exist in some special realm, and perhaps a lesson we can all take away here for our own practice is that the closer you protect them, the more forceful and motivating they can become, providing us with that energy we need to push through a project. Nostalgia Ultra. Making that was, was a, a labor of love. It was like difficult, you know, to make not like writing the songs or arranging the songs. I mean, that had a level of difficulty too, but just piecing together all the resources to do it, you know, at the level that I wanted to, like the quality of record I wanted to make and not, you know, not really know how to make beats and not really know how to engineer like that. And um, really only being a singer songwriter at the end of the day, you know, it was, it was difficult. That had a level of difficulty. Here we recognise again the deep level of creative control Frank holds over his projects. And in this final section, I want to take a step back and look at the necessary confidence that sits behind that and how we can all develop more trust in our creative talent and instinct. I guess that project really, as I'm making this new record, it's like the, I don't know, the like reminder that you can do it. You can, like you can do a body of work and you can, you can complete an idea and finish, you know, a lot of people can't finish. A lot of people suck at finishing. Frank's journey with Nostalgia Ultra demonstrates how we grow our own positive relationships with self-drive and creative confidence. Frank builds stories of success behind him and uses those to gather momentum and self-belief. Here we see him doing it with an album, but before that we can imagine this process occurred many times over. Finishing a verse became finishing a chorus, the chorus became a song demo, and so on and so forth. As artists and people, it's easy for us to focus on the negative things around our work and our creative shortcomings, but here we learn the power of remembering and collecting the small wins, knowing that our larger future goals are only many of those same actions linked together. My demons were about finishing, writes Stephen Pressfield, a novelist who discusses the creative practice. Until then, I got into the 99 yard line on every project and compulsively blown them all up. I couldn't get to the end. But the good news is, once you finish, even one time, you'll never have trouble finishing again. Coming to a close now, I want to take a look at one final tool that we can all look to to build more confidence and internal momentum for our work. But just before we get into that, a quick note to say that if you're getting value from these videos, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and consider dropping a like down below. Okay, enough meanderings, and to introduce this final concept, we're going to jump into some words now from Steve Lacey, an artist I'm looking to feature further on the channel. I found like a new 
confidence in music um that without ego though Ooh. this confidence of my love for something I was like I could be confident because I'm someone who loves music I'm a person that would be doing this regardless of the number one regardless of the Grammy nominations like I will still be in the studio making music because that's just what I do here we see a foundational piece to artistic confidence that's available to all of us. Lacey finds this through a commitment to the art itself, as opposed to the approval structures that might or might not come from the output of his work. As artists living inside a market-driven society, these foundational commitments can offer us the freedom to move in directions that might feel true to us, but not look to represent huge financial value or approval. At the end of it all, when it comes to building projects, the final word always has to come with us, and it's us who remain responsible for maintaining standards and deciding what defines success from our creative output. If I could do anything, you know, from, from today, not even looking at it in years, but today on, it's just really about trying to do whatever it is I do at a level of excellence, and that's, that's really all I'm trying to do while I'm here. So that's it from me for part one of this series, but as I've said before, I really want these videos to be more discussion starters than personal essays, so if you have any thoughts on the content that's being looked at here, I invite you to share your stories or responses in the comments below. As we play out, we're going to listen to some music that's been supplied by artists from this community, and you'll find links in the description to their work, along with information of how to send over your own music if you'd like the opportunity to get involved. Now with that said, thanks so much for watching, make sure you're subscribed if you'd like to see part 2, and peace in whatever you're working on this week.